Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Sure, go right ahead. All right. Um, what's been your biggest hurdle as CEO of On Live in your time there? Oh my God, the biggest hurdle, just one. The only good answer <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, biggest hurdle. Well, it depends. You know, we had different errors, right? You know, of development. Um, um, I think the biggest hurdle is when we first started working on this thing is not getting it locked away in an insane asylum. Um, that's always helpful. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of people, well, pretty much everyone said this will never work. Um, then, um, you know, uh, at, at other times, of course, there's been immense technical challenges in making this work. Um, you know, the um, what, what people see with OnLive today is really, you know, uh, the tip of a very very deep iceberg that you know started a, a decade ago when we were working on this thing. So you know, <clears throat> it was a, this, we spent a lot of time working very uh, very quietly on our own, ironing out lots of problems. Um, I guess another problem that was very difficult is you know when you're. It's not about making unlive work. Sometimes it's about making unlive work all the time. Yeah. And so you know. Certainly, everyone has been very focused on things like how do you get latency, you know, low enough for gaming, and I think that was certainly a technical challenge, but one that we addressed many years ago. The biggest challenge we have, um, and we had, and we, it took um, millions of sessions to solve, was um, how to make it work over every different type of internet connection. Um, one of the reasons that OnLive is the only service that actually offers full gameplay and offers multiplayer game is that it's the only, you know, it, it's because we have this technology that will actually work reliably for very long sessions through any type of connection. And, um, you know, that includes wireless connections, it includes working on different devices that have different levels of efficiency, it includes working on devices where you have another application running at the same time, where we don't always get the CPU. Um, or if the connection is being shared for something else, like you know, somebody watching video, you know, all these different scenarios are things that we had to um, deal with. And you know, at this point, um, we have hundreds of different algorithms that we use um, in different situations to make that work. You so said, I guess, you know, uh, yeah. You said you were going to be upgrading to two megabyte megabit connection limit as a as a minimum yes. connection speed. When, when um, can we expect that? Oh, I don't know. Did it roll out? Um, I I don't. I'd have to go check with ops. Uh, it is. It, it we've had. A, you, usually, when I see these things, it's you know a couple months before it actually rolls out to users. Um, and I don't know exactly what time it's rolling out, but yeah. Um, I could find out. It's um, it is a. Uh, uh, basically, what will be it will be down to about two megabits a second for PC, Mac, and micro console, and then um, it's always been you know down to um, below a megabit for tablets. Yeah, it'd be a small screen size. Uh, five hundred kbits for phones. Uh, four hundred kbits, five hundred. I forget what it is for phones, but for phones it's very small. But of course, with phones you are um, you're kind of limited in the games you can play because of the screen resolution. Yeah, of course. Um. um so, yeah, but anyways, it, it's imminent. Um, it, uh, I would say it's maybe any day now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you're going to see a flurry of new features coming out this summer. Um, I, and, I, uh, I know, there, I know there was an update. I'm sorry. I know there was an update that was done, I think, two nights ago. Yes. Could, could, that, have been, could that have included the new algorithm? It, it does include lots of new things. So let me explain a little bit of how these updates roll out. Oh. Um, what we do is we we roll out. We have to. We have thousands of servers, you know, and it takes time to kind of flow across the country. In fact, I was I was looking at um, a, a blog where somebody was saying, "Hey, I got the new um, user interface for you know folks starting up," and someone else says, "I didn't get it yet." Yeah. <laughs> and the reason is you have to realize it. It takes a while. To, you know, these are massive um, uh, images that roll across all these servers. So when you see an update, it, it kind of goes across the country and over to Europe to our servers in Asia and uh, and so forth. And the um, um, and what we do because we're we're very cautious and we have so many people actually playing games while we're doing these rollouts, right? Um, we um, act 
activate the new features sort of one by one. In other words, the code is there, loaded up with the new features on the servers, and then blink, 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 we turn it on. So the first thing you see when you see that update is actually the rollout of the actual code ready to be you know, woken up, you know what I okay, mean? Yeah. But we want to get it all in place. And then we go wake it up. That's why, so the, the capability to go down to two megabits is in what is rolled out. It's there. Um, I, the question you asked is, is it available to people? And for that, I have to ask ops when that particular thing's being turned on. Okay. We turn on one thing. We don't want to turn on everything at once because it's really hard if there's a bug or a problem to identify what it is, right? Oh, I bet. So we go, one by one, we, turn, we kind of wake up these different features. And we often wake it up during off-peak times if we can, you know what I mean? So yeah. that it, it will have the least impact. You know, look, we're, we do a pretty good job. I would say, you know, you know, 95% of the time when we add a new feature, it, it is bug-free. But sometimes there's some subtlety that we didn't realize. Um, and so we may turn it on for an hour, realize, oops, I see what this is doing, and then turn it off, and then fix it, and then turn it on again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so... So um, we noticed a new brag clip feature where you have 50 brag clip limit now. I think a lot of people are happy with that. Um, a lot of people on our website were wondering, this is a question they wanted me to ask you, is um, what they can do to help on live. So the best thing they can do to help on live is, first of all, keep giving us feedback. Um, we, we look at your website and, you know, we we listen to it. I mean, you've probably seen some changes that have been reflected based on that. We listen to the feedback that people send in the customer service. Um, we also look at just usage patterns, you know, what kinds of things people are liking and not liking. Um, and, you know, you know, OnLive is, 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 is there to, you know, obviously to, um, you know, to, to be something that people want. And so we're trying constantly to adapt to that. So if people have those kinds of, um, things they want, just let us know, or things they don't like, um, you know, give us feedback on that as well. Um, definitely let us know if you run into any kind of a problem. I mean, you know, um, most of these things are fixable, but unless we know about them, we can't fix them. Now, l most of the really, you know, it's even it's technical stuff, the thing that makes it run so reliably is stuff that we handle on our side. I mean, we, we monitor the actual, you know, connection throughput and things like that, but if you, if you are having a problem systematically. I mean, there really is no connection now in, in, in the world that we know of. I mean, short of one that's really, really in, in bad shape and be, you know, be horrible for, like, you know, browsing the web as well, um, that we shouldn't run on. If, if you've got a connection that we're not running on, we want to hear about it. And we add that to the list of things that we'll go and back and solve. I mean, the reason it's running on the connections you have right now is largely because, you know, somebody has used a, a connection very similar to yours that has the same kind of problems yours does, yeah. and then we've had figured out ways around it. Um, so I guess the other thing we, so that's, that's kind of on the service. The yeah. other thing is spread the word. You know, um, we, uh, we're a startup. We're only a couple hundred people. We don't have the, the marketing budget that a, um, you know, a large game company does or, or, or a large console company does. So, you know, just, you know, um, send people invitations. Tell them, hey, give this thing a, a try. It's free. Or this is what I like about it. Um, or, um, you know, when you see a cool thing, tweet about it, you know, or, um, or post what you like, you know. Yeah. Also, frankly, post what you don't like. <laughs> we're, we're not looking for love, love letters, you know what I mean? We, 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 we can't make it better if we don't hear about what the issues are. Exactly. Um now, we, we know that you're coming to the HTC tablets and some of the Samsung devices. Uh, do you have any plan to have to ship on live on new PCs, like where it's already installed? Some PC um, makers have come to us to talk about that. And um, because they have their, you know, we have our NDAs with them, we can't go and... Um, uh, disclose any details there, but you know what you're describing is is, is kind of a, um, a pretty easy thing for us to do. But another thing that's a variant on that is we can make OnLive work before the, um, the PC really boots up. I think you've seen that some PCs can play a DVD or something like that yeah. before it boots up. So um, people have spoken to us about that as well, and um, you know the. The schedule for when these things roll out has a lot of things that figure into it. It's, it's the manufacturer.
manufacturers to get to what they want to do um, when their products are coming out. And frankly, it's we have to triage what, what projects that we take on. Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes we go and say, look, um, we'd love to do this with you, but we can't do it until this date because we're busy working on this other thing. How, how would that be utilized, like where, where it came up as your PC was turned on? How would that, how would that work? Uh, well, you just, you know, I think you're used to the instant turn-on on something like a tablet or a phone, right? Yeah. So imagine if you hit the, the power button on your PC, and that was it. I mean, it would just immediately connect. Uh, okay. So oh, would, the would other it, thing, yeah, I'm sorry? Would, would that be, have something to do with the own live web browser? Like something like, or the virtual desktop, where you just hit a power button and that comes up? Yeah. Well, the thing is, even to get a browser running on a PC, I think you are aware you usually have to boot an operating system. But OnLive itself doesn't rely on an op The OnLive client that runs on your PC, it doesn't rely on an operating system. It doesn't rely on Windows or Linux or, um, or it, it doesn't rely on Java or, or Flash. There's, there's really no underlying code. It, it sits as a standalone, um, you know, self, a self-sustaining piece of code, which is, for example, why it's, we have, it's easy for us to port it to things like the, uh, the online uh, games, the online micro console or Blu-ray players and TVs. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of TVs, for example, we're, we'll be running on, there, there really is no OS per se. I mean, there's a little, you know, you know a, a tiny curl that runs on the thing to, yeah. to go and decide what to run. But when we, when you'll be seeing standalone apps running on TVs, they're not running on anything. Um, so in the case of a PC booting up, um, it would literally just, you know, the, uh, you know, the Intel or AMD processor on it would just begin executing on live and come up with a little connection screen. Um, and it would go and take a look to see if there's a network connection available. Uh, and if there is, you know, most likely through Wi-Fi, then it would, uh, then initiate a connection sequence and then connect and there it is. And you'd be connected. Sounds um, pretty cool. And then if you do want to browse, for example, then um, with the new you know, browsing feature that we'll be introducing later this summer, then you'll have a super fast browser and a full feature browser, but rather than having that browser have to run on the PC, and you know, any browser, whether it's Firefox or, or Internet Explorer or Safari, they all utilize the uh, services that are provided by the operating system. For example, how to render different fonts or how to deal with a Flash plugin or something like that. You know, those are all things that it, it's kind of tough to do unless you have an operating system. But the beauty of OnLive is there's no operating system needed in the local device. There's only an operating system needed in the cloud. Okay. So um, with, the, with the web browser, is that going to be able to run Java? Um, I, I think it will be able to run, well, in principle, it can. The thing that we have to worry about with a browser that's in the cloud is we can't let it run things. We, it's too hard for us to manage every possible website that could be harmful. In other words, we don't want it to be a, a launch pad for someone to go and have a website that turns into a giant spam site, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that sends out millions of spam messages through our 10 gigabit connection. So we have to be a little bit cautious in, in what we allow. The, the, the main thing it's focused on allowing people to do, because we are an entertainment service, is going to be entertainment apps, things like video and uh, you know games and stuff like that. Most of those are, are Flash-based that we know of, or something like QuickTime-based or Windows Media-based. And so those will be the first things that we um, um, you know enable. Um, as far as allowing arbitrary code to be written to run on the um, run on the, the system that's more complicated. Um, and it's not to say we're not eventually going to do it, but it's just one of those things we have to, we figure, you know, if we're going to roll out, people would rather us roll out something sooner with kind of the, the, the majority of sites that they want to get to than um, something, you know, later, which is a full featured browser. Yeah, that's true. But there's, another, there's another reason, I mean, on any device where you're going to be using the OnLive system, there is a browser, you know, whether it's a, a tablet or whether it's a, a PC or a Mac or something, you do have a browser. So we don't feel a need to completely replace the browser you have. What we would rather do is give you a browser that accelerates things that are tough to do with a local browser. Okay. Um, now, is that going to, is the browser going to be released as 
in a play pack or will it be free for all users? How's, how do you plan on doing that? Um, you know, the current plan is just let it out there, you know, to have it one of the features of the service. Um, you know, it, it's complicated because we have to go and um, be reasonable about um, usage. Um, for example, you know, if people go nuts on this thing and they're, uh, you know, because it, for example, provides flash capability to iPads, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you can easily see how people could just go and use it, forget the game service and just use it for that. <laughs> so what we're going to do is kind of monitor it and just see what kind of traffic and usage we have. Okay. And as soon, if people are being reasonable, that's fantastic. We'll let them go wild on it, you know what I mean? Yeah. But if, there, if it starts getting to the point where it's, it's going to interfere with people who are using online for gaming, then we're going to have to put up some sort of reasonable limits. But the goal is to go and make it as open as possible. On the other hand, I mean, you know, the goal is not go and bring down the whole system, right? Yeah, of course. Um, so how about the uh, virtual desktop that you talked about previously? Is that, um, mm -hmm. is that something we could see soon, or...? We, you will. I mean, if you know, people are using it now, uh, it's in beta. Um, it's a whole different market than the gaming market, as you can imagine. Um, and um, the most likely way it's going to roll out is with um, initially some certain commercial customers who are going to use it, and then we're going to gradually expand it for uh, demo usage. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of people at this point who kind of feel they, they don't really have much need for, um, you know, a whole suite of desktop applications and things like that on their local computer. Maybe they moved over to a tablet or maybe they moved over to a netbook or what have you, or maybe they just mainly do web-based things and, and only occasionally do they need to, like, do an office thing or something like that. So I think it'd be really handy for those kind of people to be able to um, instantly, you know, just click a click and boom, you get a desktop, that's your desktop that's nice and secure, backed up, no viruses, has all the things you want, and so on, um, for those occasional usage. yeah. usages. So that would be one of the things we eventually do. But, you know, just from a business point of view, it's a lot easier to go to an IT department that has a company that wants to completely virtualize their computers, and the existing solutions like Citrix are, are, are extremely expensive and, and you know, of course, have lots of restrictions and lots of inconveniences in how they're used. Okay. Um, now, on, on live, how many employees do you have? 250 to 300? What? Uh, we have 200 and something. I don't remember. We've been... Um, uh, <laughs> we have a lot of interns right now because it's summertime, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, we also have, you know, contractors who do different things. Uh, for example, when when it, a, a new game is coming out, like you know, Fortnite came out, or when um, um, you know, Fear Three, whatever it is, we also then you know work with we, we put together tiger teams, and sometimes it's internal people, sometimes it's external people to uh, okay. get those things all polished up for release. Do you, do you, do you expect to make a lot of more hirings in the next year or so? Yeah, I mean we're constantly hiring. Um, I think. With a company like ours that is breaking new ground and is doing new things, you'd be surprised how hard it is to find uh, the kind of talent that's suited for it. Uh, it's not that we don't have any, you know, interest in people coming to work here, but it's, you know, we are looking for, you know, some pretty extraordinary people that are out-of-the-box thinkers. Um, that, that's how everything, you know, that is online came to being is because of the people we have here. So, um... Sometimes we have positions that we we want to fill that have just, you know, we just haven't found that right person, and then, because we're just going to wait, and then the right person walks in the door, and boy, you, you know, almost instantly yeah. when, you, when you see them. And, uh, you know, we're, so it's, 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 it's not just kind of 200, peop 200 plus people, it's uh, 200 plus um, very extraordinary people. Um, you have a little over 100 games on the service now. How many do you think you'll have, say, by the end of 2012? Do you have any prediction? And it's so a year and a half from now, yeah. um, I don't know, maybe a th more than a thousand games. Really? I mean, well. Uh, well, because think about it, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know this exactly, but I think Xbox and PS3 are pushing a few hundred, you know, almost a thousand games, maybe they have a thousand. 
but that, that's sort of what you see in a mature platform. But 2012 will be a mature platform. I mean, a, a more an easier number for me to estimate is at the end of this year. You know, we'll have over easily over 150 games. I don't know exactly how many and exactly, um, um, you know, it, it's hard to predict the exact what yeah, happens. Yeah, of course. We, we keep having publishers coming and giving us their entire, you know, who walk up and, and, and they say, look, okay, we've used this thing, it was, we've been trying, and we've seen the, the usage growth, and um, we want to go and make available our entire library, both our back catalog and our, and our future game. So it's, 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 we're in a funny situation right now. Um, we have more games that we have in process than we have up on the service. Um, and we're completely just backed up on our resources in getting them running. Now, with the new games, of course, we give the highest priority to them, and uh, those are you know coming out as they're introduced. But with the back catalog games, you have to, I don't think people appreciate how, how difficult it is to get some of these games to to run <laughs> because we, we don't have the source code. We only have the um, the EXE files for them, and the team that developed them you know is long gone. So we have to create a virtual environment for each of these games uh, to make them work in a stable way and on live. And very often we're doing, um, you know, um, uh, emulation of for the controller if we're able to get a controller to work with it. We're adding yeah. another layer now because what we're seeing with the new uh, player is that uh, the online player for tablets is the touch controls. And so again, the, yet another um, controller emulation that we're doing for existing titles. Some of these titles are brand new titles, but just ones that were not conceived with a, uh, a touch. touch screen in mind. Yeah. Um, so what about uh, bandwidth caps? We've seen like Verizon and Comcast talk about limiting bandwidth. A lot of the ISPs have already done that. Do you have any plans to overcome these caps somehow? So two things. And, you know, as much as we hear about these caps in the press, they actually... There's very few examples of people that have really run into them. I mean, there are certainly very, very heavy users, but um, most of the reason people run into gap bandwidth caps is not because of online. It's usually because of, you know, more passive activities like television viewing or, or you know, Netflix and things like that. So, you know, um, more active, you know, inter interactive activities, you know, playing gaming is, is pretty intense, right? And you're very focused on it. Um, people tend to do that for fewer hours than they do um, watching TV. So... Usually what happens is if somebody has a bandwidth issue, it's, it's not because of on live. In fact, I can't think, I, I, there may have been a couple, maybe one or two posts where people have run into a cap, and you've probably noticed that yourself, that it, it just, it's not something that people really report is happening. Uh, yeah. so, so I think part of the reason is this. I think that the ISPs have these bandwidth caps, number one, and they, they enforce them, you know, some enforce them more strictly than others, but also I think some of them, you know, don't enforce them if they see it not happening. They, they, they don't feel like the person's really abusing their network, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and they, if, if they see it, it's, it's a normal user, they're going to, um, you know, have normal patterns of usage. They don't want to lose you as a customer, right? You know? That's true. And, yeah, and, and, and so I think it, it just had not come up. And then the other thing you got to realize is that the bandwidth requirements for OnLive, I know this is a funny way to put it, are actually going down. Because as our uh, technology improves and the algorithm improves, our bandwidth requirements for a given resolution TV is less. Really? Whereas ISP bandwidth keeps going up, and bandwidth caps will keep going up. So at worst, this is a very short-term solution. You know, um, in the long term, it's not going to be something anyone even thinks about. Okay. Um, if you had to say what the best, say, few three or three to five features that are coming to OnLive next, what would you say they are? The best three to five features? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are so many features coming. This, um, you're making things popping up this summer that will blow your mind. Um, so, um, best three to five features. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, you're, you're going to see... Uh, the voice chat's going to get a lot better and richer. Um, I think that um, I'm very excited about um, the universal controller coming out and allowing you to play games on every device, you know, TVs, tablets, Blu-rays. When you see on live built into your TV, it's just, it's just you know, mind-blowing. You turn on the TV and you can instantly play any game. 
it just totally changes your world. And I think everyone realizes that we can achieve lower latency in a TV than we can um, outside of a TV, right? Because the TVs themselves, in, the, in re- receiving the HDMI and converting it, you know, yeah. int- introduce latency. So it's it's really cool. Um, let's see the um, um, best features. Um, well, um, the, 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 the announcement later this summer that I think people are going to be pretty excited <laughs> about that is um, going to be you know things you'll be doing on live that um, just can't be done anywhere else. And I think when people see that, um, it's just going to change their worldview about what what gaming is and that well personally to me that's kind of been you know something I've been very very excited about getting to I mean the games we have and the the new games that are coming out they're all you know some of them are really really exciting and wonderful I just it amazes me how far people push the envelope with uh, existing technology but you know what we've done so far is we've had games that are are really ported from local devices and that we're, we're we're making available in the cloud and so far, none of these things, none of these games are really taking advantage of what the cloud can deliver, other than all the other various conveniences and instant play and, and so on and bright clips, and et cetera. I think when you begin to see um, um, what's possible with games that are, are cloud only games, then your whole your whole world model changes. It really does, um, and I think you're going to begin to um, change your thinking about the way games are delivered. Um, sort of the way they're monetized. I mean, we're already seeing a little bit happening with uh, online games where they've got, uh, you know, free premium games or, or, you know, free-to-play kinds of things. Do, or, do you plan you know, on offering games. free games whereas the publishers make money through advertising? Either advertising or through some in-game things that you buy, you know what I'm saying? So more I mean, like... Let's all be realistic. There has to be some um, economic model, otherwise the games won't exist, right? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Um, but... The, there are all these different ways that, that people will be able to monetize be able to monetize games, which will make sense. I mean, the, the goal is to make it work for every kind of gamer, whether there is a um, the person who really has very very limited means, and to the person who has has the resources and the enthusiasm to get into gaming. The, the way the model is set up today is a little bit funky in that you know. Sort of a lot of people get, if you really don't have any money, people, you know, might have pirated games. Um, and then the people that do play the games, I mean, think about it. They're sort of supporting the piracy, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. And you may not get the, the best games out there. Uh, what I'd rather see is, is sort of a ramp, you know, where you, you have everything from games that are effectively free because they're just advertising supported to ones that have some in-game content to, you know, a game that is a persistent, all-encompassing, amazing experience that you decide you really want to go dive into and maybe you have the you know if you have the resources to afford it and it's just a really cool thing and then maybe there's parts of that game which are less expensive for people that want to engage in a, in a lesser way or maybe that's all they can afford right now i'm looking for that whole continuum from free all the way up to ultra premium so so you think and we'll see some online can do that you think we'll see some free games outside the play pack or um, you will. Um, I mean, we already did one. Um, Amnesia came out, and there's also kind of free things. I think you've seen the Humble Bundle thing we did. Yeah. Where you went and bought the game, but you can you can choose you the price. You what you want, yeah. <laughs> you know, some people did choose free. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, it's stuff like that, where here we, we're trying really hard to work with the gaming community out there, whether it's the indie community, we can start seeing games posted on, on live that have most really cool mods in them, okay? So, uh, you know, it's the same game, but with a mod that someone figured out who was really good. And, yeah. But we're going to make sure that, you know, if, if it's, you know, I gave this example before in another interview. If, if, if some guy modded the game for auto-aim, it's not, um, um, it's not uh, only available for one person in multiplayer, but you have, a, you have the auto-aim multiplayer and the non-auto-aim multiplayer. Yeah, so you're you know not going mean? to mix the players together. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, things like that that people do with, with PC games and things that the publisher never thought of or whatever, didn't have time to do, I mean, those are really cool things. Why shouldn't everyone have access to that stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah, so 
what we're going to do is just, you know, set it up so A, it's easy to get to, and B, it's, well, it's not used as a way to ruin somebody else's gaming experience, right? But rather it's used as a way for everybody to enjoy it. Are we gonna, are we going to see more social-based games, like how we see them on Facebook, like Farmville and stuff? Yes, and that's where I, I think, and again, I don't want to drop too many hints where I shouldn't be dropping them, but again, I, it's not for me to go in and disclose what the publishers are doing, and they have to go in and, and make their own announcements. But what I can say is this, that, you know, when we added Facebook to on Live, and, you know, you do your Facebook login, and, you know, you can post and everything, um, we didn't just go and add Facebook for our users, but rather in our SDK, you know, the software developer kit that, the game publishers have access to. There are now hooks for them to go directly into Facebook um, when their game is running on on live. So now they can build a game that is as social as they want to be, or as little as they want to be. You know, whatever whatever makes sense for the particular game. Okay. I mean, if you want to do something to the degree of a Farmville or a Mafia Wars, go for it. You know. Yeah. Um, or if you just want a more casual, you know, more you know, maybe you just want a way that you can go and send out a big invite to a whole bunch of friends to say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm playing this thing, or I need somebody to run, who's good at running this particular, you know, tank or something. You know, those are the kind of things that um, you could do with social gaming. Yeah, that's, that should be interesting to see. Um, how, yeah, how about... Well, the other thing is, is gifting people stuff. You know, like, hey, um, you know, you go, I, I earned this thing, I'm going to give it to this other guy who's a friend of mine who then... Maybe he'll give something back to me later yeah, on. Yeah. That's another thing you see with these social games that you'll soon be seeing um, within the service. Hmm, that should be interesting. Um, do you ever have... You do these updates where people download the update and stuff, but you don't actually tell us what the updates are. Do you think at some point you'll be able to let us know what the updates are? We will. And we sometimes we do it and sometimes we don't. So, first of all, let me apologize for not being better at communicating that and then let me then let me explain why um, I, I talked about a little bit of this earlier in the in the interview I, people maybe do not appreciate it, it, people I don't think appreciate just how difficult it is to be maintaining these um, maintaining a, a cloud gaming system with so many things going on at once and working reliably. I mean, we have some people that might have three, four-hour sessions that work seamlessly. Maybe you've done that yourself. What you don't realize is during that time, we've gone through several different what are called day parts um, um, with that ISP and with your particular you know, local area and who knows what else is happening on your computer or what's happening in the Internet. And the system is constantly adapting for all those different cases, and it's got to keep your game running through all of that so you're not, you know, uh, disrupted. Yeah. And um, so when we release a new feature, we release it and we don't want to go and tell everyone, hey, this new feature is out there because we want to release it, if you will, into the ecosystem. We want to release it in a way where we see normal utilization. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And see how it behaves to yeah. see whether there's some sort of rogue behavior we did not expect or some unusual situation. Maybe it's in the third hour of this guy's gameplay that this particular feature goes and, and has some sort of adverse effect. That allows us to take it down if we have to, fix it, and then put it back up before it becomes widely known that this... Because if everyone pounds on a new feature and there's some sort of weird bug in it, then it's very difficult for us to go and pull it back and fix it, right? Yeah, that's true. So, that makes sense. So we, we're, we, slowly introduce, we slowly introduce features into the ecosystem. And our goal, I re realize it's not telling everyone about it, but our, but our goal is to make, it, make sure that when it's widely used, it's very, very stable. Okay. Um, the age-old question about EA, what's the status with them? Uh, well, um, they remain a partner for, with OnLive, and that's why they're on our website. And I, I can't speak for them. Um, but how if I answer the question the following way? Um, currently, we are working on, um, um, we, we have, um, how can I put this? Currently, we are working on games from, um, together with effectively every major publisher in the world. Um, and there are different stages of development. There's different stages of business negotiation. 
they have, they, they have different objectives. Some of the big guys have some really big plans and things they're doing. Some of them, some of them just have some other priorities or some other things that are going on in their companies that, that hold things up. So um, while I can't go and, uh, and, and speak for any publisher um, at all, what I can say is that um, it's our expectation that um, as we become a mature platform, you know, you'll eventually have games from every publisher that you want their games from. I mean, ultimately, when it comes down to it, all these publishers would really like to have people play their games and have access to it. Um, and that's really what their agenda is. And, you know, I, it, the, a fair thing for them to be concerned with when we first launched was whether or not online was going to be reliable, whether yeah. people were actually going to adopt it and use it, whether or not the business model was going to work and it was going to be monetizable. You know, many, many things were, were out there that people were uncertain about, and that's why we only had 19 games when we launched. But where we are now is we've got over 100 games, we have over 50 publishers, and um, there's no question that, uh, you know, uh, it worked, people liked it, um, it's, a, it's a sustainable business. You know, all these questions that were of huge, huge levels of uncertainty uh, a year ago have all been answered um, in the affirmative. You know, so I think that um, we've maintained as best we can, you know, our relationships with all the publishers, even with the other game platforms and other things like that, and with retailers, etc. cetera. Um, at Online Core, um, we're, we're not really uh, what I would say, you know, people whose objective is to go and, and make the biggest, grandest, and hugest business in the world, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, at our core, we're, you know, we're technologists and creative people and gamers, you know what I mean? We're, yeah. That's what really motivates us. We want to see as many people as possible have access to this technology and use it. Now, the flip side of that, we do have to make it so the business works, otherwise we won't be around too long, long. we'll <laughs> continue to sustain the business and uh, keep it going. So we're very cautious with that. And, you know, look, um, when you're dealing with any businesses, it's always hard to go and work with them. Okay. If I may say one other analogy, and that is, you know, the thing to understand when any new platform arrives, not, not even talking about online, whether it's the, you know, a new phone platform, whether in, or in the case of web TV, when I did that many years ago, when, when any new, new platform arrives, there is um, the, the parties, the, the strong, the largest entities that are the incumbents, you know, the existing companies there, have the least incentive to be the first ones out in a major way on that platform, right? Yeah. You know, it's the guys that are, are the either middle guys or the guys who are the up-and-comers who have the most to gain from being the first and pioneering a new platform. And we're seeing the same thing with online. I mean, just look at where it is. I mean, you know, but what, what happens is once it gets pioneered by the, um, you know, the middle and the, um, and you know, the, the, like, for example, the indie guys adore online, right? Yeah. Um, then what happens is once the platform is established, then the other guys come along. It's not that they ever hated us. It's just it's not worth their while. Yeah, they to just want to do what's best for them. Right? Are small. Yeah. Well, that that makes but sense. But our numbers are large. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't believe the growth we've seen just in the last two weeks, and you know it's so everyone's recognizing that, and so it's it's a simple business decision for them, right? Yep. Um. You you said you're uh. Well, we know you're moving into the UK this fall. Uh, what what other countries do you hope to move into after the UK? Can we can we expect to see you in Asia soon or? Where? Well, online is in Asia. People are using it there, um, much the same way that it's in in Europe. Um, and the um, there's a the only difference I would say between Europe and Asia is the taste in games is very different. Um, you know, if you look at Japan, Korea. Um, and China um, and, and Taiwan, you know, each of those um, um, markets, just there's very little overlap. I mean, there's some things, I think like Legends of Zelda and World of Warcraft, there's, there's a few of them out there that, that, that seem to go across cultures, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a very, very short list. Now, Europe and the United States have almost a complete overlap. For example, Major League Baseball is not going to be a big success in Europe, and cricket is not going to be a big success in the United States. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but pretty true. much everything else uh, crosses over. So, so the European launch is largely a matter of um, 
regulatory issues, which is the first thing we've got to deal with. And then after that, there's a small amount of work for language stuff that we have to do. Okay. We already have are set up to handle all the different types of currencies. Um, we already uh, have the rights for these different um, titles and these different uh, countries and so on. But you just have to realize when you're releasing, when you're not just showing demos, but rather you're actually having full games and you're doing transactions, then you get into each different country's rules and how they handle it, how the taxes work, you know. Oh, my goodness. As I said, we're, <laughs> this is about the center of our world. You know, it's not the thing we like to do the most. We like to work on the technology. But um, nonetheless, we have the right people in place to go and one by one um, um, knock out each country. Yeah. Um, how about parental controls? I know you said that they're going to be coming to you on live. Do you have any plans to make it so that they're going to be I, I know Netflix has like the multiple device thing where you can have multiple devices using the service. Do you have any plans to have like multiple accounts for a family, so that the yeah we haven't yeah we haven't we haven't locked that down yet. Um, part of the thing with parental controls is we we work with you know people like ESRB here and Peggy P E G I in uh, Europe to make sure that what we do falls right within what they like to see. So you know it's. It, it's not just a technology or a feature. You got to go and, and get those things in place. As far as multiple accounts and different ways to use your accounts, you'll be seeing some very creative things coming out um, because we, we have, the, the, of course, the flexibility to do um, lots of different things. And generally speaking, the publishers, within reason, you know, are support that kind of thing. I mean, look, if they, they see that the people are really going and you know taking advantage of it and and trying to just you know you know, get around, <laughs> effectively, yeah. you know, get games for free when they, when they shouldn't be, well, okay, that's when you get to see them begin to draw a line. But um, generally speaking, the, the kind of thing that you've seen with parental control, controls on other game systems you're going to see with on live, except you see a few wrinkles because, of course, it is, um, it's, it's great that you can, um, a simple example, if, if you want to, you can watch your kid playing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or you get a notification your kid is playing and then join them. I mean, wouldn't it be cool to do, uh, you know, I don't know, Lego Harry Potter with your kid if you have a little break at work or something like that, uh, or if you're on a business trip? Yeah. Well, yeah. with online, that's possible. And um, so we're going to um, try to make it so that we have some um, uh, some of these really neat features available for, for people as we roll out the parental stuff. So, so you think it'll be like one account where it, with several logins for that account with different controls on each account? Um, it won't be quite like that, um, but it, the, the general concepts will be that, you know, there'll be this idea of, you know, uh, the parents' accounts, you know, it's the master account, which can go and control how other people who are logging in. I mean, if the parent okay. wants to go and restrict their own use, I mean, we, we've had some people actually say, you know, I, I just rather not see certain brag clips because they're, you know, um, they they're, they're offensive to their taste or whatever. Yeah. Sure, you know, we're very happy to let them shut those off if that's what they want. Um, but, um, so I think that you'll see, um, um, again, it's hard to describe, but it is, because it is different, but I think you'll be seeing a parental control system that's not too unlike, at its basic level, what you see with, um, you know, existing, with, with other game platforms. Okay. But you'll be seeing some, you know, on live-ish wrinkles, which <laughs> are going to make it pretty unique. All right, cool. Um, I know somebody, I, it was one of the execs at on live talked about how you're in talks with Sony and Microsoft about perhaps bringing on live into the PlayStation or Xbox. Is that is that something you think would happen, or is it just talks right now? Well, so I think if you look at the, the quote that came from, um, I think it was um, uh, Joe Bentley was talking to somebody yeah. in an interview, and well, he was just, he didn't say, that we, we can't disclose <laughs> who, who, who we're having just business discussions with, because we have, you know, in, uh, NDAs with them. What he was saying is that we are very open to working with all okay. those different publishers, and you'd be surprised that we have actually pretty good relations with all of them. And you know, more uh, detail than that we can't share. But what, what I, I can share is this. It's just um, um, you're going to see some announcements later this year, which I think is going to surprise everyone about um, how the, the game ecosystem is going to be changing. 
And, you know, the, the people at, at all these companies, they're smart people. They, they recognize, um, you know, what's happening and what's evolving in terms of technology. Uh, they, they understand where we are. We've got a, um, not only do we have a very, you know, a very reliable technology that works everywhere that, for example, supports multiplayer, you know, um, there's a lot, a lot of things that are very hard that we, that, that work very, that work because of the online architecture, you know, our, yes. and, you know, you can have a land because we have, you know, three data centers in the States, uh, we can have multiplayer that are land based like experiences and they can, um, you know, these are, they recognize that this can um, both work in, they all recognize how this can work in a way that is uh, very complementary to things they're doing. And we've not taken, I, I think that the best way to go to communicate probably what Joe's trying to say is that we, we've never taken the position that we are trying to quote unquote kill the consoles. I know that's what you see sometimes in the press, but that's just yeah. not our agenda. Um, this is a, our, our live has the ability to go and work as an adjunct to consoles. If somebody wants to demo something and then, then go buy the disc, we can even have, have it so that we do a referral. Um, we can, um, it can be used uh, on a console. It is possible, I'm not gonna say it is being done, but it's possible to make online run on any game console and then you can have all of the online service or maybe just demos, anything that, that makes sense. And so if anyone wants to do that, they could. And um, it is possible also for um, uh, for the client, some of the things that the consoles have to be integrated into on live, if that's what um, uh, we would do together with them. But whether or not these things are going to come into being, you know, as I said, whether they do at all or when they come into being is all a matter of timing, you know, business negotiations, uh, oh, you know, whether they want to go and, um, you know, disrupt sales for a particular thing that they're launching or a particular timing, et cetera. There's so many different fa factors that figure into it that even with, you know, internal to the company, for me to go and put a date on it, I don't know of when these things are going to be. But what I, but I think it should be pretty clear to everyone, anyone, everyone in your blog, and it's pretty clear to everybody who is, you know, is being, you know, who is, that we've spoken to who really uh, has an understanding of the game industry, that what online has done is, is the way games are going to run. Um, and it's not a question of whether, it's just a question of when. Yeah. And uh, it's a question of, uh, you know, it's a question of sort of who adopts it and um, gets ahead of the curve and then who is sort of um, kind of left being, you know, left behind. So I think that um, then it gets into, you know, all sorts of business considerations and other complicated things that are not fun at all, but nonetheless that um, you just have to go through in order to go and, and, and make headway. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's one more wrinkle. I, I, it's not really in your question I wanted to mention. So go ahead. Um, we... Um, um, reared in the, the incubator that, you know, incubated on live and MOVA and, you know, um, provide the seed fund for Android, et cetera. Um, um, you may have seen, a, a, I, didn't, I didn't expect it to get out to the press because I gave a presentation at Columbia University yeah, you where I mentioned the new technology, but you probably saw this thing that came out and this one picked up, you guys picked it up, it got picked up by a couple other blogs and... I have to be in New York talking to Wired Magazine. <laughs> it was interesting because I was speaking about it in fair, fairly general terms, and then, then they saw that it, it had gotten out, and so they wanted more detail, et cetera. <laughs> so you, what can I do? It's filled out. Um, yeah. All right. Well, a lot of people don't realize just what a big deal that technology is going to be for, for on live. Um, it is effectively zero latency internet connectivity. Really? Wow. Yeah. So what we have running right here in Palo Alto, out of Alan office, is is wireless connectivity that is much faster than cellular networks, has no congestion, and has sub-millisecond latency. Now, to give you a comparison, 3G has about 150 milliseconds of latency. Now, because we've worked with at and they're one of our investors on LTE, which is, you know, 4G, we're able to yeah. get that down to about 40 milliseconds of latency. 
uh, really just for on live, not for general usage, but for on live. There actually is a special mode in 4G which will um, give us that lower latency. That's just for AT&T, though. No, no, it'll be for LTE generally. They okay. added it to the standard. Okay. Um, LTE is um, AT&T, Verizon, you know, European. Uh, all over the world, people are pretty much standardizing an LTE for 4G. 4, LTE is going to be pretty darn good. Um, it's, yeah. Um, but still, 40 milliseconds of latency for gamers is still, you know, for most people, 40 milliseconds is awesome. You know, for all these enterprise things we showed, it's like whatever. It's like you'll feel like you're there, right? Yeah. But for, um, you know, for a first-person shooter, no, no, we want it down to nothing, right? So um, what, I'll, what we'll be rolling out with this new technology um, is online integrated into the system so that you'll have, you know, that, you know the, with the last mile, no matter what you do, whether you DSL, cable modem, fiber, whatever, you're always going to have somewhere between, you know, 15 to 25 milliseconds of latency. Then there's, there's other inefficiencies in just the way the internet works. So with this technology, I mean, literally, you're going to have, um, um, you know, um, latencies that are so low and bandwidth that is so high that we'll be able to be far lower latency than a local device. Then you go and say, how can that be? Because you still have, of course, the you know, compression time and you know, the transport through the internet and so on. Yeah. So check this out. If I were to go and um, deliver a what's called a, a 4K resolution um, a video signal. Now, this is what we do at uh, Reardon. We have a, I, I could probably point you at a link which has a sample of a video like this. It's the new resolution that's going to be used in movie theaters. It's 4,096 pixels wide. Wow. Okay. So they call it 4K, right? So we can deliver uh, 4K resolution press video. And even with the compression, it's much higher resolution than even 1080p. Um, and we can deliver it not at 60 frames per second, but at 240 frames a second. Wow, that's so crazy. So running at the native 240 frame per second resolution of your TV set, right? Yeah. And your TV set would just hang on the wall. There's no wires hooked up to it at all. In fact, the wires slow it down. And in fact, the processing in the TV would normally slow it down. So there's no lag in the TV either, right? So it just hooks up to this, um, this new Dido wireless stuff. And there it is. You have sub-millisecond connectivity. By the way, the audio is surround sound and completely uncompressed. So you have full range audio. Um, you'll have 240 hertz, 4K resolution video. And because it's, it's running at 240 hertz, the actual frame time is less than four milliseconds, right? So if you were to use a local device, whether it's a PC, console, any local device, okay, by the time it's fin, by it's, we will have your, your screen drawn before, you know, your screen, you know, your data sent to the data center, the new frame computed, the video compressed, sent through this new wireless technology, and then arriving on your screen before a normal computer monitor would even finish drawing a 60 hertz screen. Wow, that's, that's now, crazy. How cool is that? <laughs> now, is that, that's just going to be through the LTE, or would that be through, like... No, 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 LTE can't do that. No, it's just through oh. this new wireless technology oh, we okay, developed. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, I see, um, so that's, okay. So this new wireless technology will enable on live to achieve lower latency than any local device. And all, because there won't be any bandwidth limits, really, for it either. And so, it's a, it's something, you know, you notice that we have investors that are carriers, you know. Yeah. So our carrier partners... We just announced a relationship with Juniper, our network partners. MOVA, the people <laughs> doing the face, facial stuff, that we're, you're going to see all the pieces come together. And as I said, it didn't it leak out not quite the way I hoped it to leak out. <laughs> 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 we, we were hoping to do a little more of a coherent explanation of this, and I'm sorry that it's coming out, but yeah. I'd rather you kind of hear sort of how the pieces fit together than it yeah. Yeah, just kind of spilling out the way it's been going out, right? Yeah. W w but when basically... When yeah. do you, when do, can we expect that to roll out? Is that something that's going to be soon? Um, it's, it, so it's, it's it's in development now. I mean, uh, it's not till next year. I would say that this is coming out, but oh, yeah. uh, nonetheless, uh, you'll you'll see it. I mean, basically, what you're you know we're working with the infrastructure that's there today, but you'll be seeing um, results of um, what happens with dedicated infrastructure um, coming soon. 
Yeah, some of the people who are doing the, the uh, beta testing in um, in the UK at, with BT who are using um, you know BT Infinity are, are yeah. seeing a little bit of this in a sense because you know they're, we're, they're they're getting a fiber connection that's hooked up to the carrier that's also um, running on live and there is a but it's a um, so anyways I, I think that the future that's coming is, is very, very exciting, and it's not what people think. There's, <laughs> people are so focused on the present, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's sometimes frustrating me, and uh, we're doing the very best we can with the present, and it's we're doing super cool stuff, but I, the future is going to be utterly mind-blowing. You're going to be looking at a scene that you're going to have a tough time distinguishing between what you're seeing on the scene and what is in the reality of the room around you. Yeah. Sounds pretty incredible. So that's where that whole wireless thing comes in. Everyone kind of missed the fact that it's ultra low latency and that's unlimited bandwidth. Well, who needs ultra low latency and unlimited bandwidth? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why I was wondering. I was wondering if this was something that was going to be separate from OnLive or was going to be integrated into OnLive somehow. And now it'll I know. Be it'll be, it, well, it is a separate company, but it'll be integrated but it's with OnLive. Is um, that, is that the main way you plan on using yeah. it? or? Is what? Is that the main way you plan on using the technology? Is just for on live, or do you plan on? Well, using I wouldn't. Have, we wouldn't have had to develop something that's this ambitious if it were not for on live. Um, you know, uh, it's, uh, there's not many other applications out there that need such low latency, right? Yeah. Um, so we, it was a big consideration, and um, the other thing we knew is, um, I mean, on live is is nice in the sense that. It does require a large amount, of, I mean, a relatively large amount of bandwidth. I mean, compared to, say, you know, I don't know, email. I mean, these days it's not a large amount of bandwidth compared to, um, um, you know, to video, right? Yeah. Um, but it is, it's still, um, when you get to, when you start doing, one of the reasons where we've been tuning the algorithm to go and bring it down is when you get to things like 4K resolution, um, and, well, particularly then when you start doing, you know, uh, 3D at 4K. You know, like, for example, that's what they would use to um, project, you know, something like Avatar in a movie theater. They do 4K at 3D. Um, but now it's going to be in your home. In fact, it could be in a portable device. And as I said, it's going to look exceptionally um, um, real. And when, you're, when you get into that, it is the case that... that that is more bandwidth than we're going to need now, but it still is a fixed amount of bandwidth, right? It's not a variable amount of bandwidth. I mean, the trouble with, with downloading or with websites is that you get these bursts of bandwidth where yeah. when you're trying to download that game, boy, you wish you had a gigabit of bandwidth, right? <laughs> yeah. but then you're not using hardly any bandwidth at all, you know? So with OnLive, it's a steady amount of, of reasonable amount of bandwidth. It's a little high these days, but in two or three years, everyone's going to think, oh my gosh, you know, the amount of bandwidth needed for um, you know, streaming on live is, is de minimis, you know? Yeah. Well, um, that sounds awesome. Uh, it's really all the questions I had. I didn't expect to get cool. through all of them. Um, Sorry? I didn't really expect to get through all the questions, but I did. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks. Uh, the only thing I just want to pass back is, you know, uh, I think it's great that you guys took a chance on us in creating this forum. It's great to see you guys evolve from foreign. It's a journalist that are being picked up by Google News and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so it beats you matter, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I think you guys have been fair and balanced. And um, when something's not right, we need to hear from you. I don't know. Every once in a while, you know, you guys pick up on something, and we see in the forum. You may see Matt Jensen jump in and yeah. say, "Hey, we're on it, guys." You know. <laughs> so. Uh, um, a, Please assume the best from us, you know, um, that our, we're, we're trying to do the right thing. We, we're, we make mistakes, and what we're doing is incredibly complex and difficult. And um, forgive us for being cautious, but believe me, if we were not, and we were just kind of rolling this thing out haphazardly, you'd be far more frustrated, you know yeah, what I mean? And so sure. that's why some of these things take a little bit longer than you might like, but believe me, the end result if you see if you could see what we have in our labs, your minds would absolutely be blown. <laughs> Should be exciting. Okay. I can't and, wait to see it, them. It's all coming, it's just it's not gonna come instantly. Just we have to have to roll it out in a way that it's nice and stable and reliable, right? Yeah. 